Hello friends, welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943 in Stalingrad. In his memoirs, he tells in detail the story of the Wehrmacht disaster near the city on the Volga River. Links to other parts of his memories can be found in the description below the video. It was a gloomy Christmas festival. Towards 6 p.m. on the 24th December came the news by radio that Hulth had been obliged to retreat. We were as if stunned when a little later we gathered for supper with General Paulus. In his short speech, the commander-in-chief touched on Hoth's shattered relief attack and the collapse of the whole southern front. He spoke of the now severely threatened army group A in the Caucasus and the seriousness of our own situation. Despite everything, we should not give up hope. After a few words on the meaning of Christmas, he concluded, and so we too have gathered together under burning candles to think of our families back home as they think of us at this time. The crass contrast between the brutal reality of the war and the Christmas message could not be glossed over by words. Everyone realized that this evening there was some very quiet thinking, almost the quiet of the grave. Some lit candles on the table had been decorated with balls and tinsel, and next to each plate lay a couple of cigarettes and two or three chocolates, which General Paulus had brought in a large confectionery box that had been sent to him from Romania. There was no post at all from home, no parcels, no letters were distributed. Heavy snowstorms had almost immobilized air traffic. My wife and daughter had sent me a lovingly packed Christmas present some 14 days, if not almost three weeks earlier, by post. It never reached me. I had not written about our hopeless situation to my relatives, realizing how much my wife was suffering over the death of our son Heinz. But nevertheless, they surely knew that a disaster was looming over the area between the Volga and the Don. Despite this, several items that were flown in reached us very soon after supper that evening. Everyone wanted to be alone with their thoughts or to sit together with their closest colleagues. I too was expected by my staff in the room which served as our office. The brightly burning fire in the stove gave a little coziness. I had prepared a small present for each of them. Some cigarettes or a cigar. A few slices of crisp bread and biscuits wrapped in newspaper. The Army Group Adjutant Colonel Von Werder had sent me two bottles of brandy, which I now placed on the table. Best of all was a small Christmas tree that one of the non-commissioned officers had made from a package from his wife that had reached him three days earlier. To all this, Senior Sergeant Major Cupper had contributed some candles on a carefully shielded stand. They all looked expectantly at me. What should I say to these four comrades with whom I had worked for over a year, and who had been soldiers long enough not to let me make a fool of myself? All were married, all had families. I told them truthfully about the events outside the cauldron. Then we talked about our homes. The four of them had received mail during the last eight days. Letters and photographs made their rounds. We forgot everything outside in this conversation. We chatted together happily for hours. The candles burned themselves out. The bottles were empty. Towards midnight, I entered my adjacent room and office. My driver added some sticks of wood to the crackling stove. I pulled off my boots and jacket, extinguished the light and lay down on my camp bed. Thoughts went round in my head for a long time until I finally fell asleep without having come to any conclusions. When I entered the office the next morning, the first day of Christmas, my colleagues were seated at the table drinking a dark brew that called itself coffee and chewing the crisp bread and biscuits I had given them the previous evening. They wished me a happy Christmas, and Senior Sergeant Major Cupper was the first to shake my hand. With his pale, sunken cheeks, he seemed even thinner and taller than usual. During the night, the hope of seeing his wife again had almost expired, and with the other three, things looked no better. I attempted to boost them up, but not at first. To do this I had to lie. We had to have more work so that there was less time to think. I turned to Cupper. When you have finished your breakfast, come to me. Seeking distraction with work seemed to me to be the best, perhaps only way. There was not much more for an adjunct to do, yet something of an occupation could be created. Couple put together the figures of how many soldiers and officers of the 6th Army were away at the time of the stopping of leave on the 19th of November, thus were unable to return to their units at the end of their leave. Further, how many should have returned daily? That will soon be done, Colonel. 
From our army's daily orders we can ascertain how many men went off on leave daily. We only have to ask the 4th Corps for their figures. Give yourself time and make it exact, I repeated as the telephone rang. Schmidt wanted to see me. When I came to him, he said, You know the situation, Adam. We must reckon on strong attacks in the west and south of the cauldron in the next few days. Our weakened fighting strengths will force us to reduce the cauldron. At the moment, there is no establishment to deal with our retreating troops. In order to establish it as quickly as possible, I must have our chief engineer, Colonel Sell, here. Radio Army Group with a request to fly in Colonel Sell. It will be done as quickly as possible, General. Sell is leading a battle group at Chur. Deal with the matter urgently. There are enough officers out there to replace Sell. Why should Sell have to be commanded to take part in our almost certain downfall? The new position could be taken over by any engineer battalion commander. And how would they dig into the stone-hard frozen earth? That is what went through my head. On the other hand, I would be happy to see my friend again. I knew Schmidt well enough to know that it was completely useless trying to advise him against his decision. So I went to the signals officer and sent the radio message. Finally, I sought out General Paulus. I had not seen him yet that day. Lieutenant Colonel Zimmerman directed me to his dugout. Paulus was there preparing a message to Army Group Don. As I entered, he was sitting at a desk. My Christmas wishes he returned most heartily and offered me a chair. The question regarding the chance of a breakout was still open and lay burning in the air. Hold on, the 6th Army is fulfilling its historical mission on the Volga. Paulus quoted the first sentence of an order from Hitler. My hands are tied in every way. I understand you, General, but what sense does this holding out have now? We will not get out of here anymore. Can we reply that the whole army is going under? You know the orders. The formation of a new defensive position in the southern sector depends upon our holding on. I am responsible if Army Group A suffers the same fate as us. Six weeks have passed, General, since the order was given. In my interpretation, it has long since been overtaken. That is not quite correct. Manstein informs me that Army Group A is holding on to its positions in the Caucasus as before. I don't understand that the Army High Command had six weeks to withdraw the troops from there to shorten the front. That would have freed up Panzer divisions to support Hoff's attack. There is no sense in going over these questions. It is too late now. Even if we want to, we cannot now get away from here with our broken, emaciated army. The German main front line is hundreds of kilometers away from us, and apparently has to withdraw it even further. No one will help us out. I spoke to all the commanding generals, divisional commanders, and Schmidt at the end of November and recommended we break out on our own, but Hitler was immediately informed by his liaison officer, Major von Zitzwitz, who has his own radio, and introduced his countermeasures. Paulus stared for several seconds at the plank wall of his dugout, then he turned his gaze on me. He saw from my expression that his comments had not removed my doubts. You are not happy with our discussion. I know what you were thinking. You are comparing my handling of the situation with that of Reichenau last year when he initiated the attack on Donitz against Hitler's orders. When I nodded, he went on, it is conceivable with that daredevil Reichenau that after the 19th November, if the 6th Army had fought through to the West, Hitler would have declared, now you can go over my head, but you know, Adam, I am no Reichenau. Paulus had really guessed my thoughts. He spoke the truth as if he himself, as a loyal general, characterized the careful assessor, the overthoughtful waverer. But even with this self-criticism, he did not cut through the vicious circle in which he, I and many others were entangled every bitter day. Whether Reichenau or Paulus, both men's intentions were aimed at the continuation of the war. A correctly timed, successful breakthrough by the Sixth Army would perhaps have postponed the final defeat of Hitler's Germany, but it could not have prevented it. Such a result would not have changed the imperialistic, anti-national character of the War of Conquest. Would the Sixth Army really be saved if tens of thousands of those who survived on the Volga were slaughtered in the subsequent fighting? But on the 21st December, we were still far from such insights. We simply functioned correctly and badly as cogs in the heavily laden German war machine. When I returned to my dugout, Copper had laid out the required material. 
At the beginning of the counteroffensive by the Red Army, some 25,000 men were on leave. Every day about 1,000 men had returned to the front. What happened to these leave people, Colonel? If they were here, we could close some of the gaps. Presupposing that they are meanwhile not also starving or frozen. Apparently, General Pfeffer was to collect them together and make them available to the army. But that came to nothing. On the orders of Army Group Headquarters, all those returning were put into the battle groups. Oddly enough, every day some of those returning from leave are flown back to the cauldron on the supply aircraft. I telephoned several of the divisions today in order to get the precise figures for the information you required. One clerk told me that whenever the aircraft carrying these men arrive, an announcement is made over the loudspeakers instructing every officer and soldier to report to the railway station commandant. Nevertheless, some make their own way and ask for the airport, where the pilots take them on as machine gunners. If these unsuspecting fellows had known what was happening here, they would certainly have remained outside. I can thoroughly understand that cupper, but that is the comradeship that forms in pleasure and sorrow. It brings back many to their units. Colonel Elklep visited me on Christmas Day. Is there anything new? I asked him, after we had shaken hands. Has Schmidt told you about the long-distance telephone conversation he had yesterday with General Scholz of the Army Group? No, was there anything special? There is nothing new from the Chur front. Schultz said, however, that the 6th Panzer Division has been withdrawn from the Hulf Army to protect Morosovsk. The pilots of the supply aircraft report that the left wing of Army Group Dawn has been withdrawn to the west. Until now it has not been possible to check the enemy offensive. It seems to me that the Army Group wants to keep us in the dark over the whole situation, as before. In any case, it confirms that there is no longer any escape for us. The 6th Panzer Division forms Hoth's main striking force. If it is unable to overcome the enemy, then things will not go well. It is clear that Hoth and the two remaining weak Panzer Divisions will have to withdraw. Doubtless Manstein realized the new catastrophe as early as the 16th, or at the latest the 18th December. It is incomprehensible that he should not have informed Paulus and given the codword thunderclap. The order for the breakout would have doubled the strength of our soldiers. Every following day that uselessly passed, Army Group told me, we should have initiated thunderclap. Fuel and supplies would have been flown in, but only when the weather was suitable. That is clearly a mockery, Elklep. What do Manstein and his staff then really think about the state of the Sixth Army? That has nothing more to do with military necessities. I share your opinion. Paulus is writing a new report on the pitiful state of our divisions. The following day, this report went to the Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Don. It ran something like the following lines. Bloody losses, the cold and insufficient supplies have allowed the fighting strength of the divisions to sink drastically of late. I therefore have to report. 1. The Army can repel weak enemy attacks as before and still deal with local crises for some time providing there are better supplies and replacements flown in. 2. If the Russians send stronger forces against Hoth, and with these or other troops proceed to attack the fortress, it will be unable to resist much longer. 3. Breakout is no longer possible if a corridor has not been achieved and the army stocked with men and supplies. I therefore request that higher commands are made aware that energetic measures for the fastest relief of the army are taken, otherwise the whole situation will force them to become victims. That the army will do everything to hold on to the last moment is self-evident. The army continues to function. Today, only 70 tons were flown in. Bread tomorrow, fat tomorrow evening, no supper for one corpse. Drastic measures now urgent. The commander-in-chief of the 6th Army wrote a new message. Looking back, one must say that at this point in time, on the 25th December, as Manstein's strong 6th Panzer Division was withdrawn from Hoth's replacement army, hardly any more breakout orders could be given from our own resources. The 6th Army was now too depleted, lacking fuel, heavy weapons, tanks, and ammunition to attack the Iron Ring and the bitterly fighting Russians without substantial help from thrusts from outside and establish a connection with the forces of Army Group Don. I believe that Paulus was unable to make any reproach if he himself was unable to make any decision of his own at this point in time. But how often had he, and all of us, 
not done so. All of us had dutifully reported, ordered, and kept silent. While there was still time through our own efforts to present the facts to the Supreme Command and save the lives of tens of thousands of soldiers who were later to be starved, frozen, and killed. This question and the resulting responsibility for the defeat of the Sixth Army rested with all who had the highest command functions for clothing the surrounded units. The motives and considerations that had been played out in the decisive command posts of the Sixth Army could be explained, but not excused. We were prisoners of the order and obey system, but was not that, when the order apparently went against the traditional Prussian-German military concept, itself immoral according to its moral code. Even more denied to us was the vote for the real alternative to the sacrifice of the Sixth Army ordered by German imperialism. The alternative that lay in a timely capitulation. We completely lacked the political insight for doing this. On Paulus' orders, all preparations for the breakout from the cauldron were cancelled in the following days. The assembled trucks were sent back to their units. Captain Tuck resumed his place with a senior quartermaster, but was soon afterwards ordered to the airfields of the supply aircraft leaving the cauldron. Dear friends, that's all for today. Please support this video with any comment and don't forget to press like. It was Tim, and see you.